In our plans for this evening's program, we have tried to find individuals who had had some close contact either with the man Hoover or with his work and its effect throughout the country. We have sought people who could speak to you on different aspects of that man and his career. And the first speaker who will address you on the subject is a man who has been active in law enforcement problems for quite some time. He is a captain in the Sheriff's Company of the Allegheny County, not just the city of Pittsburgh, but the whole county. He is also very active in chaplains affairs and is on the advisory board to the chief of chaplains, travels extensively around the army installations and uh, has a chance to see the troops on many areas. And he comes to us as an old friend. He's been here before. He's talked to us on a number of subjects. But tonight we have asked him to talk particularly about this man who is one of his heroes as well as one of ours. And it is always a happiness for me because of a long journey that he and I took with Billy James Hargis one year. And uh, I got to know the man quite well. I'm afraid he got to know me quite well. And, but the time we came back, we were really friends and have been so ever since. So it's always a pleasure to have him here with us again, and it's always a satisfaction to me and an honor to present the Reverend W.O.H. Garman. Thank you, Colonel Bunker. I assure you all that the feeling is mutual. We think a great deal of Colonel Bunker, and uh, of this organization, especially of the fine work that's being done by the Colonel and Mrs. McKinney. It was Mrs. McKinney who at the behest of the Colonel called me long distance and asked me if I couldn't be here. We're going to do the best we can to cover a very extensive subject tonight in 20 to 25 minutes. There'll be several other speakers. And if you think that I haven't shown uh, justice to some phases of the life and the work of Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, it's because we have other speakers who will be sharing this rostrum with me. I'd like you to know, first of all, that I appear here in uniform tonight with the knowledge and the consent and the blessing of our Sheriff's Department in Pittsburgh. Mr. Coon, who is our Sheriff, is an excellent police officer. He's a Democrat, and I'm a nominal Republican, but we all vote for Mr. Coon because of his record, excellent record, as a police officer. I'm fairly well acquainted with the work of Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, not only because of some years of police activity, I was an officer with the state of Pennsylvania for seven years, and for the past several years, I've been connected with the Sheriff's Department in Pittsburgh. We have an auxiliary that I've told you about. Uh, when they all are on hand, we should have about 500 men. And I have mentioned the fact they're divided into a mounted corps. We also have a firearms unit, and uh, that's my particular field. And special services, I'm in that. We have a communications unit. We have 12 search and pursuit planes, six river patrol boats. We have uh, communications units not quite complete. When it is, we'll have two sound trucks that can receive any of the broadcast anywhere in western Pennsylvania. They're all operating on a different band at the present moment. And then right now in the making is a medical corps. So I'm happy to be able to represent that body here tonight and to extend uh, the felicitations of my fellow workers to you because they too, like yourself, are interested in preserving this wonderful country 
which Almighty God has given us, and likewise our Christian heritage. <clears throat> Thank you. Perhaps I can best show the estimation that the people at large in this country have had in Mr. J. Edgar Hoover by reading a few extracts from his biography as it appears in Who's Who. I uh, clipped what I'm reading from the 1969 edition. I didn't want to take 72. I compared them. They're quite identical. Mr. Hoover, as perhaps most of you know, was born in Washington, D.C., January 1, 1895, son of Dickerson N. and Annie M. Hoover. He had several law degrees, Bachelor of Laws, Master of Laws, and Doctor of Laws. And you may be interested to know that some 20 colleges and universities conveyed uh, upon uh, Mr. Hoover, various degrees. I'm not going to read them all. One of his great distinctions was to be recognized by the president who gave him the award for distinguished federal civilian service in 1958. And then he received the Great Living uh, Americans Award of the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, the American Christian Award, and he well deserved that, as we'll attempt to reveal in my closing remarks. Also, he received the Washington, uh, the George Washington Honor Medal Freedom uh, Foundation Award, which was a gold medal, the Americanization Gold Medal Award, and then quite a few uh, awards and recognitions by various uh, police groups. Of course, as you know, Mr. Hoover departed this life, and I think it was a natural death. I haven't been sold on the idea yet that he was murdered in his sleep. May the 1st, 1972, the go to be with the Lord, whom he had loved and served so faithfully throughout an entire lifetime. In addition to reading from his biography, I'd like to bring to your attention some of the things that great men, publications, have had to say about Mr. Hoover. I have human events before me here for June 10, 1972, and it reads as follows. I'm only reading part of it. On May the 1st, 1972, J. Edgar Hoover died. He had served his country for 48 years under eight presidents as director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, its only director. He ably and actively discharged his duties in that position until the very day of his death at the age of 77. The Lord permitted him to die with his boots on in a sense, didn't he? To him goes the credit for building the FBI into the finest law enforcement organization in the world. And many have remarked that the organization he built reflected his own virtues, for he was indomitable and he was incorruptible. He occupied a special place in the hearts of all Americans who respected and were inspired by his courage, his integrity, his self-discipline, his dedication to duty, and his love for country. His passing marks the end of an era. But the legend he inspired will grow with the years. Christian Crusade Weekly of May 28, 1972, quoted several other comments. For instance, uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger called him an American legend, and he was. President Truman made some very apt remarks before the funeral and also at the funeral service, and I'll read just a brief statement here. Speaking in, did I say President Truman? I'm sorry. 
President Nixon, pardon me, speaking in low tones during his 11-minute talk, the President said of Mr. Hoover, he was one of those unique individuals who by all odds was the best man for a vitally important job. I'll have another statement to read toward the end of the message from this same publication, which was made by the pastor of Mr. Hoover, whom I knew. As a matter of fact, we shared the same room on one of these military tours. I have before me here a statement made by the <coughs> Honorable Larry Hogan, who for 10 years had a, been a member, associated as an agent with Mr. Hoover. I want to read parts of it, just parts of it. J. Edgar Hoover has had a tremendous influence on the history of this country and on those of us who had the privilege of serving with him. His 48 years of public service are unparalleled. At the age of 29, on May 10, 1924, Mr. Hoover was named director of the scandal-ridden Bureau of Investigation. We'll tell you more about that directly. At the time, Attorney General Harlan Fist Stone told a young man, I want you to take over as acting director of the Bureau of Investigation. Young Mr. Hoover, who had worked in the department since 1917, he had been a special assistant, <coughs> replied that he would take the job on condition that he be divorced from politics that appointments and promotions be based on merit, and that the Bureau be responsible to the attorney, uh, the attorney General only. The Attorney General replied, I wouldn't give it to you under any other circumstance. There's more here I'd like to read, but now I'm going to pass on to something else. I've already indicated uh, the nature of the organization we have in Pittsburgh. One thing that's absolutely demanded of every uniform officer is that he must attend and graduate from the police school, which I did several years ago. He must also uh, take a course in jiu-jitsu, and several weeks ago I finished 48 hours at that, <clears throat> and in first aid, and every man must qualify every six months in combat shooting. Uh, these are absolute must. No exceptions are made in any case. She either can do it or you're no longer a uniformed officer. One thing that we had to study was the work of the FBI, and incidentally, our entire course of study was paralleled uh, to that of the FBI, copied from it. I don't mind telling you that. There was nothing original about our play school. We had to study basic law and especially English law. We had to study homicide. Maybe you wouldn't like that because you worked on actual cases. And some of these poor people surely were carved up by the folks who can no longer, in some places, be executed, you know, for murder, which I think is a shameful thing. We uh, also had considerable work, and it's not done yet, in identification, in arrest uh, procedure. And again, I want to tell you, all of this was copied from the FBI, their methods, their practice, uh, they, their way of going about things. Now, there were quite a few other subjects that we covered. One thing we had to be familiar with as a publication I'm holding in my hand, Know Your FBI. I'd like to recommend you get it. Uh, Mr. Robert Fay of the new director's office promised me it would have several thousand copies of these publications here for a free distribution. So far they haven't arrived. I hope they will. I express my appreciation to him for his interest, and he was the office there was very much interested in what we're doing. When I spoke to our local agent, Mr. Ian McLennan, who's in charge of the Pittsburgh office, I said, Mr. McLennan, give me a brief, now just a brief, rundown of the history of J. Edgar Hoover. 
You'll be interested in what he said. I knew this. He said the history of Mr. J. Edgar Hoover is the history of the FBI. I said, I know that. But I thought that being in your work for so many years, you could give me a concise statement. Well, that was the state. And the history of the FBI is found in this and other similar publications. No, your FBI. And uh, this particular number that I'm holding tells you what the FBI is. I'd like to read the statement verbatim. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is the investigative arm of the United States Department of Justice, headed by the Attorney General, the nation's chief legal officer. Then there's another statement here. I never met Mr. Hoover personally. Some of the men who are going to speak tonight have. We corresponded. Occasionally, when I had information that was important, it was sent to the Bureau, either in Washington or Pittsburgh. We uh, had some very fine letters from Mr. Hoover. And I know that Mr. Hoover would want you to know the entire truth tonight. A considerable amount of the credit for the success of the FBI as the greatest police organization in the world, of course, rested on Mr. Hoover. It was his responsibility to see that the thing worked efficiently and properly. But he had considerable assistance. A splendid corps of agents. He had the cooperation of local uh, police departments. And he had perhaps the cooperation of a lot of you people tonight who sent in vital information on occasion. And of course, he had to have the cooperation of presidents, uh, Attorney General, the members of the United States Congress. And that cooperation is all recognized here in this publication. I've already mentioned the fact that there was a bureau before the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It was merely called the Bureau of Investigation. It came into existence in 1908. And it was, these men were appointed by the Attorney General to handle the work of investigation that was carried out by men who were representing his department. Their uh, duties, their scope of activity at the first was quite limited. And then it was in 1924 that J. Edgar Hoover, who was working in the office of the Attorney General, was promoted to be in charge in this by Harlan F. Stone, who later became the Justice of the Supreme Court, whose name you no doubt recognized, to be the director of a bureau that came to be known as the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Perhaps you need some explanation as to the scope of this body in a very short time. Crime was running rampant. This was the early 30s, when uh, men like Babyface, I think you remember that name, don't you? And the Barkers and uh, Pretty uh, Boy Floyd and uh, many others that we could mention here by name were actually running hog wild in America. Organized crime was defying the government, constituted law and order. Congress saw fit to pass several acts. As a matter of fact, there were five altogether the Kidnap uh, Statute, the Federal Extradition Act, the Federal Bank Robbery Act, the National Stolen Property Act, and then before they were through, 180 types of investigation was turned over to the Department of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. From the very beginning, Mr. Hoover was very careful in selecting men for this bureau. They had to be law graduates, graduates in law, or accountants. I understand there were a few exceptions. I've been told that. I don't know of an exception, but I understand there have been. And these men were given very, very careful training. And these are the men who, back in the early 30s, uh, turned out to curb organized crime. Several times it was 
I wouldn't say my honor to sleep in the headquarters of old Al Capone, the walls of which were just pockmarked with machine gun bullets. Well, Al, and men like Al Capone, the Dillingers, and uh, many others were put out of business through the effort of the FBI. And that's one of the great contributions that Mr. Hoover and his agents made to this country in helping to restore to a considerable degree the law and order that we have today. Another great service that was rendered by the Bureau had to do with running down and apprehending spies. This is quite a record. As a matter of fact, I have a considerable file. I have thousands of files for that matter. But I have a considerable file on sabotage, subversion, spy activities. If you want to know who it was who put a crimp in the activities of these men, even before World War I, it was the agents of the FBI, or men who represented the department uh, that they took over. They made it absolutely impossible for these men to operate any longer with a free hand. They had been. Prior to uh, World War II, the president was very apprehensive of the sabotage work that uh, they might carry on in what I'm going to term defense factories that manufactured aluminum, various metals that were strategic, ammunition, guns, and things like that. The FBI was given the assignment of making an investigation and suggesting a plan that would have to do with a safeguard and protection of 2,300 such plants, which they did, and did most ably. One story that has always intrigued me is the story about two Nazi U-boats. One landed, four men, on the shores of Long Island, the other landed four agents on the coast of Florida. These uh, four agents between them had almost $175,000 in cash, just a few hundred less. They had enough explosives with them to act for, well, to last them two years, it was estimated. They were given a program, a schedule. They were to blow up Hellgate Bridge. They were to blast uh, communication centers, and uh, they were to set department stores on fire. They were to do everything that they could to throw this country into a state of panic. Within two weeks, the FBI had all eight agents. I want to tell you that's a record. It's almost like the record in 1969 when 97 percent of the men that they arrested and were responsible for their prosecution were found guilty and sentenced. I wished all our local police agencies could do likewise. The uh, FBI during World War II did a magnificent service. Colonel Bunker and I was discussing this yesterday. Shall I tell him what I told you? No, all right. <coughs> during the war, I don't like to have to say this, but I knew all about the perfidy of the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had been forewarned that the attack on Pearl Harbor would quite likely take place the next morning at about 7.30. And as perhaps you know, he did nothing about it. Maybe you want to know why he didn't do anything about it. How many of you folks are from Massachusetts? Well, quite a few. Get this. At that particular time, Senator David I. Walsh was one of your two senators. The senator and I had uh, many close contacts. I was in and out of Washington repeatedly. And uh, on occasion, I don't mind telling you that when I traveled abroad and discovered things that were of any value to our government, I passed it on to the proper authorities. I was asked to lecture three times at the, by the president the U.S. Naval War College. And uh, this had to do with the strategy for the war that was coming. David I. Walsh told me months before Pearl Harbor that Mr. Roosevelt, 27 months, this turned out to be when the attack took place, had planned to attack the Japs. 
chief of staff had talked to Madeline, telling them that we didn't have enough bottoms to transport men, ammunition, and other supplies. Your big problem in war, as the colonel here knows, is supply. And getting the material there, the f f fustus and also the mustus. Well, he was talked out of it, but he knew all about the attack. When the attack took place, I went to see your senator, and I found him sprawled over his desk. And when I came in, he lifted his head out of his arms, and he said, My God, sir, uh, Garmin, as you know, the Japs only beat us to the punch. Well, I knew it. He made me promise I'd never divulge that. I didn't. My wife's sitting back here. She knows that I had to carry that horrible secret all through World War II. I still did everything I could to assist and to help my nation in spite of a thing like that. Now at the present moment, the FBI is carrying on other wars, as perhaps you know, with uh, communists, with activists, and they have been doing an excellent job. I don't mind telling you, I have no scruples, whatever, against them wiretapping the phone or whatever means of communication it might be of men who are under suspicion. I, I think they're at a great disadvantage at the present moment. There's a lot more that I could say uh, about Know Your FBI and the work they're doing. There are two things that I'd like to mention that every up-to-date police force in this country appreciates. One is the NCIC. How many know what that is? A little louder. That's right, National Crime Information Center. We have an office in the Sheriff's Department. We have full-time employees that work there. They do nothing else than contact this center to corroborate findings, get the record of various men under uh, suspicion. This will shock you, or maybe it won't shock you, but uh, it might surprise you. Often within five minutes, we have a man's complete record that we don't know anything about until we get the information from Washington. They certainly have been on their toes. There's another department in the FBI which has been of tremendous assistance and that is their crime lab. I don't know what we'd do without that crime lab. We have a crime lab that's patterned somewhat after the FBI institution, but uh, there's only one crime lab, lab in the world that can compare with what they have in Washington. And they have a magnificent lab there. This thing of detecting criminals now is truly scientific. You'll be surprised what they can learn about your activities this day when taking parents from underneath your fingernails? Are they paint that rubbed off a of car under your car or hair that's on your coat? Are uh, your footprints? Hundreds of things like that they can investigate and by so doing have made a tremendous contribution. Now I'm going to hurry to a conclusion. I imagine my time's pretty much over. I wouldn't be very happy tonight if I couldn't say something about Mr. Hoover's Christian testimony. He was, what I think, the world's greatest lawman. I have had a lot of respect for men in Scotland Yard, but uh, I have more respect for Mr. Hoover than any other lawman I've ever read about. Did a magnificent work, was absolutely incomparable. He did a great work for his Lord, too. I have already indicated I have thousands of files in my office, and I have saved things from many years back, so many years back that occasionally agents have come to my home and said, can you prove that so-and-so is so-and-so? I said, yes, I can prove it. How are you going to prove it? Well, in one case where they didn't have uh, any identification, I said, I can prove it all the way back to 1921 by photographs I, that I have of that particular person. Turned out to be a Russian agent. They said, how do you happen to have him? I said, I was suspicious of that man from the first time I met him, and I kept saving photographs under various aliases. I have here 
a publication what 100 great men say about the Bible. And included in the 100, this is 35 years old, so Mr. Hoover's Christian testimony isn't new, it's old. Among the 100 is this, is Mr. Hoover's statement. It is my belief that the Sunday school is of utmost importance in the training for citizenship. This early religious teaching is necessary if our young people are to contribute their full measure to the happiness and stability of the community when they are called upon to accept its responsibility. Now, since his passing, many others have had much to say. And uh, I have present before me here Mr. Hoover's own testimony, which appeared in a Washington newspaper, uh, the Sunday Star, for December or for January 2, 1972. May I read an extract or two? Mr. Hoover said this. His pictures are on the article. He was asked, how has the Bible influenced your life, your career, and your work? And here's his answer. I have read the Bible all my life. Over the years, the teachings of the Bible have been the guide to my daily life. If you want to know why Mr. Hoover was such a great law man, the article tells you. I'm not going to read it all because there are other speakers to follow. He was tremendously influenced by the teaching of the Bible that Almighty God is the sovereign ruler of the universe, that government is a divine institution, that God approves of law and order, and he approves of apprehending and punishing criminals. And he acted accordingly. There were many people who made comments on Mr. Hoover, but perhaps you'd like to know what his pastor said. Dr. Elson said this before a crowd of 2,000 at the time of his funeral, our loss of clergymen. And I'll tell you why he mentioned that. For a considerable length of time, J. Edgar Hoover had prayerfully considered being a preacher. And he had weighed this matter and struggled over uh, the decision as to whether he should enter the ministry or law. I think he'd have made an excellent preacher, but I thank God that we had a man like J. Edgar Hoover heading up the FBI all these years. Now he goes on to say, uh, our loss of clergymen in the church, he continued, has been the great gain of the legal profession and a lifetime of devoted service to the public. And after reciting the Lord's prayers, perhaps you know they did if you were at the service, the 25-man army chorus, and uh, they have a magnificent chorus, I've heard them several times, sang the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And then Dr. Elson read from the 46th and the 23rd Psalm and several selections in the New Testament. Then he added, <clears throat> I knew him intimately. I knew him well and had unbounded admiration, respect, and gratitude for him as a person. He recalled that Mr. Hoover sang in the National Presbyterian Church Choir as a boy until his voice changed and he was later a teacher and assistant superintendent of the junior department. Then in addition he added this, which I'll read in brief on this next page. <clears throat> According to Dr. Elson, much of Mr. Hoover's emphasis on religious education, character guidance, boys clubs, boy scouts, youth activities, and his emphasis upon character development arises out of early devotion to God and to his country. Mr. Hoover had been a trustee in that church. Mr. Hoover had been asked to accept the office of elder, but declined due to the fact that he said uh, that he'd be away too often from that particular field of duty. And now I'm going to say a few things in conclusion, and they'll be brief. 
The Apostle Paul, prior to leaving this life, as you read in 2 Timothy, in the last chapter, said, I am now ready to be offered. It's not that part in particular that I want to emphasize. But he says, I have fought a good fight. Do you remember that? I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. I think we could say much the same thing about J. Edgar Hoover. He had fought a good fight. He had finished the course. He had kept the faith. And henceforth, as a reward, there is laid up for him a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to him and to all of his people who have loved his appearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will.